Welcome to the Legislate podcast, a place to learn about the latest insights and trends in property, technology, business building, and contract drafting. Today we have a wonderful guest, Jake Fox, founder of Paper Round. Jake, welcome to the show. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us what you're doing at Paper Round. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm Jake. I set up Paper Round in the start of this year. Paper Round is a digital marketplace to connect students and businesses together to complete ad hoc bits of work. So really Paper Round is there for those busy UK founders that have a giant to-do list. I'm sure we've all got Trello boards that have a million cards on. Um, and you're trying to prioritize your time, Paper Round is there where you can delegate some of those tasks to qualified UK students. So it's our way of helping UK small businesses get more done and helping students in the UK pick up relevant experience towards a skilled graduate job. That's great. And Paper Round is present in how many universities or how would it work if I was a student at one of those universities to find a job? Yeah, so we've currently got students from about 20 different universities around the UK. We actually recruit our students di directly rather than university, through the universities at the moment, mainly just finding them online. All students, regardless of university, are crying out for that experience. So when we get in front of them digitally, a lot of the taskers are up for signing up. They have a simple onboarding process to set up their profile. They set their own availability and they set their own price. Um, most of our students have booked out at at least national living wage, which is really good to see. Um, and then from there, their kind of profile is, is there to be their sort of beacon to the world about what makes them great. Um, not only talking about their degree, but talking about their interests. Some people are really into kind of environmental sustainability or into uh, fashion and stuff like that. And they can get picked to do jobs based on these kind of great interests and also their practical skills as well. We find a lot of students put the time in to do a bit of a side project and set up websites and run their own sort of events and campaigns and stuff. And it's these kind of proactive projects that make them great ad hoc taskers for, for, to complete business projects. That's great. And how many projects have you enabled via Paper Round? So I think we did our 250th just recently, which has been great to see. And all this work is paid as well. We don't do any free labor through Paper Round. So I mean, students have earned multiple thousands of, multiple thousands of pounds now. And kind of really just starting to ramp up and expand the services that we are that we're offering we started with those sort of desk-based semi-skilled tasks where founders probably don't want to spend time doing it but they do appreciate it when it's done whether that's kind of stuff like graphic design and social media content or it's things like market research and data analysis that's great and so what's been your favorite moment so far favorite moment so far that's a good question i the first time we had a business where we'd got past that first network of friends and family using it and a random business just found us and booked a tasker in and they completed a project together. I was like, oh my God, it's worked. Someone has just done a thing on a thing that I've built. That was a big one, mainly just because there's value there. If a stranger can come across you and, and see the value and, and plug into it straight away and give it a go and there's the, you know, obviously we're a marketplace, so there's benefit to two people, not just one. Then that's really good to see. I guess the next best moment is it's like a long moment rather than one moment in time. But when you see the reviews come through of businesses being really happy with these students that they found and where it's, oh my God, she saved me so much time. I didn't want to spend six hours fiddling around on Canva doing that thing. And they just did it for me. And now I can, that those really positive reviews coming through. Um, and that's a good thing as well. I'm going to add one more in, sorry. But I'm just, the uh, one other one, which was a tasker messaged me saying I've actually been hired by the company that started booking me out on paper round in the first place, which is an awesome feeling because that's the whole reason our mission that kind of started was this idea that let's help students pick up these nuggets of experience that are lying around in the digital workspace. And then that should lead to things. And it did do. She got booked out for a few hours and then ended up, they just ended up hiring her full time. It's like this kind of community engagement person and she, she loves it and there's just that there's that kind of discoverability factor kicking in which is awesome to see that's great and i would let say i always find it nerve-wracking when complete strangers come to your platform first of all because you're yeah. wondering how do they find us what are they looking for and yeah, totally. it, it also always seems to be that whenever there's a complete brand new stranger there's always a bug that they'll find <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah, totally. Um, managing that and managing expectations. But um, could I ask, could I ask you what yeah. your best moment has been so far? I'd say it's been relatively similar. We were quite lucky early on in our journey to stumble across a large landlord who wanted to give our system a try, and 
this was you know just after version one had been built and was ready to accept users within the first week of them using the platform we onboarded 150 new tenants in one week and i guess it was quite an achievement because the platform didn't crash and in the grand scheme of things there weren't that many issues so i'd say that was probably one of my favorite moments so far totally now you've had some traction and you're a bit more established what would you wish you'd known before starting paper round luckily paper round isn't the first startup i've been involved in and i think the first time you go around and try to do something is like that's a massive learning curve i think the second time is more market-based sort of knowledge and mistakes rather than just general entrepreneurial founder journey stuff although saying that once you've got a live product out there it is amazing to look at how users want to or try to use your product rather than the way you thought they were going to use your product and they always find a way to use it in a way that wasn't the way you built it which is you like you laugh at it and it's why why are you doing it that way and you have to go find out and then that's what where that kind of iteration comes from and this is like this weird bit where you have to factor in that people are just different people will interact with something in 10 different ways even if you built something that you think is actually quite simple knowing how to factor that in and get that best guess is i think that's a skill that's how, that's, that's how i predicted the future sometimes Did, has and, that happened to you guys as well yeah i think especially when 10 people can access the same service on 10 different devices on yes. 10 different internet connections a yeah. lot can happen and you know you mentioned that users have interacted with the product in, in ways you didn't necessarily anticipate has that influenced your roadmap and your vision for the company? I'd say it's influenced the roadmap, the 100%. The mission, probably less than the kind of vision. I think the way people behave around a product can, can be solved with tweaks to user flow or, or just giving people the option to use it in the way, the way they want to use it. But ultimately, the, the business as paper, regardless of whether you book them in advance or come back to pay them or you search by a different type of filter and things like that, regardless, it is about students and businesses completing projects together for the benefit of both parties and the longer term vision you have this like the, the, the microcosm of, of the product but like the longer term vision is really a national vision to bring s way more businesses and students together across the country and we launch a, a marketplace in each city and it's about supporting regional networks as well i think there's so much talent in the uk which potentially gets lost or just isn't found because we don't have those networks in place and that discoverability and so many companies now are thinking about but well, what are the skills we're going to be needing in a few years time what is that emerging talent looking like and this is our way of saying well, look you can start trying these people out now you don't have to you can give them something real to do now and you don't have to sign up to a year-long placement thing or anything like that you can just start giving them stuff to do and see what those skills and, and those people that are there ready to be booked and start bringing them through and that's still got that local feel to it and i think that's a wider vision of bringing the future of work closer together and, and based on your marketplace and data are you seeing any trends both in terms of skills that employers are looking for or jobs that students are looking for and um, yeah it's been an interesting one we took a best guess with digital sort of semi-skilled tasks and that is what we get used for like i mentioned the kind of creative output so analytical kind of work I think what has been interested is people's um, remote working has changed very much how we work, but not necessarily who we want to work with. So this idea that if someone is a bit more local to you or they share an interest or that there's that kind of bit of context or something that brings you together a little bit better, you're probably going to pick that person, which is why, although 99% of the jobs on paper round are, are delivered remotely, we, we still see that people have this idea that they like the idea of working with a student in their city. Um, so we help facilitate that. It's just an interesting thing that there's always things that are going to bring us together, even if that thing that, even if when we work together, that thing isn't actually tangible in front of us. That makes sense. And I guess, especially if remote work goes hybrid, you, you want people to be close. So yeah, 100%. Good insight. And so as a company which facilitates work, are you, you know, providing the contracts to the students or, or how, how would that work? We make it really simple. We don't we don't really set up the students on, on on contracts. They're really just freelancers and they're in charge of their own jobs and tasks that they pick up. They don't have to pick up everything. We don't contract them to a set number of hours. What we're really trying to do is make it um, 
work for both parties because you appreciate as a student, I'm sure you, you're the same, but your life changed week by week and your availability did too because you, maybe you have more lectures, maybe you've got things to go to. It's not, things aren't as routine, which means there's no point trying to contract students into a particular slots of hours. When in reality, what works better for them is just give them a due date for a project and they'll work towards that deadline and it's the same with the business. So when we think, think about contracts and things like that, what we're really trying to do is build a, a terms of use and an, ex, and an onboarding experience that makes sense. So those tasks can basically fulfill their, what they want uh, to the best of their abilities. That makes sense. And, and so yeah. in your day-to-day -day job, then what are the contracts that you interact with the most frequently? Contracts, yeah, an interesting one. So when we did our funding round in April, that was some long contracted word in it. and as someone who doesn't really speak legalese that mm -hmm. was a, a pretty stressful time but I got my head around it by getting some pulling in some favors from someone who knew a bit more but I guess the other thing is really like like those kind of early team stuff where this when you're a big company you just have employee contracts and maybe they're incredibly typical but when you are trying to incentivize people early on we've I've been putting together co-founder agreements and stuff like that and Maybe it's a bit of pay, but it's also this kind of equity stuff and there's vesting schedules and things like that. And that's the kind of bits that I've had to set up over the past few months and figure out and make sure that we have really outlined what's going to be clear in terms of well, how much equity you're going to end up with, over what period do you earn that and how does your, is your pay related to that and other stuff around that as well. Like some, I know some people are paid more incentive based, like by, based on the hidden key objectives and basically just figuring all that stuff out. So effectively, the contracts that you've been working with right now have been to set up the business. Pretty much, yeah. An early, early, uh, early team member stuff. Yeah, things like IP, obviously, are important to get across straight away. Um, don't want anybody stealing the whole concept, even when you're starting out. Yeah, especially when you're starting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially when you start. Had there been any objections or in that whole experience of dealing with contracts, was there anything that stood out as something that you thought could be improved by a solution? I think any, anything where people are hunting around to get advice from people needs a solution that they can look to and feel confident in their decisions they're making. If the only way you're gonna be making a decision is because you've got a mate who did this, then often you're not in a place where you've got all the information you need, which I've definitely felt like before, where it's, you know, what's the typical thing here and what clauses do I need? And, the, the other side is like advanced Googling, like the amount of times you spent, what is this bit here and, and what's typical, what's fair? Sometimes just someone telling me what is the typical, what is the typical relationship that happens here is really good. But if only one person can tell you what they did, you don't know if that's an outlier or if that's normal. So that kind of stuff there. And, I think the, and then obviously putting them together and agreeing on them is a very formal process, but it's just incredibly, it's a lot of reading through and really making sure you're not getting caught out. Like there's, there's stuff that terrifies me where it, Sometimes a contract could be so long, some, somebody could put a sentence in that I miss <laughs> and it changes the relationship or it changes what's agreed because there's a lot of stuff to read, there's a lot of stuff to take in, right? Contract clauses are highly interconnected and, and that's definitely something that we try to model and legislate so that if you remove something, it will make all the required changes throughout the contract. And mm. if you insert something, you know, first of all, that you've inserted and second of all, you see it throughout. But, but the other thing that you said, which resonated with me was, how do, how do you know that if this is a standard term? And mm. the, the truth is no one really knows unless you're, you're dealing with that contract every day with lots of companies and businesses and, you know, legislators yep. is, is provides those services. So we are aggregating data and we will shortly be releasing those aggregate statistics to our users so that when they're creating an NDA, when they're creating an employment contract, for example, we'll be able to say that 75% yep. of our users choose these terms so that people who are not familiar with those types of contracts feel as if they're going with the group. That yep. makes sense. Yeah. So, and that, and that's just like peace of mind. Totally. Yeah. To, be, to be like, oh, okay, this, the typical length of these contracts is about two years. So we'll set it for that. It's just, yeah, absolutely. So I'm conscious that we've already taken a lot of your time. So I'm going to ask you <laughs> the closing question we ask all your guests. If you were receiving a contract to sign today, what would impress you? Yeah, it's a good question. There's probably a couple of bits, to be honest. I think 
interactivity is so much nicer. I, I'm yet to have an experience of a contract. I'm yet to have something where there's stages to what I'm doing. So most contracts can get sent over and it's basically just, I've got a ton of stuff to read. That's just, that's not really, that's really not an experience in any way. There's no guiding me through, there's no breaking it down or anything like that. So I guess that's one side. Um, I think the other thing is, if a contract could explain the legally to me in stages, if I could select sections or just look at stuff where I'm like, okay, but what does that actually mean? Because what is it in my language kind of thing? Um, then that would be cool. Do you happen to be doing that stuff? <laughs> if you're not, you shouldn't be. We, we definitely make it a staged process and we, we try to okay. make it as interactive as possible, both through the questions and answers, which gives ownership to the person creating the contract that we are tailoring a contract which is bespoke to their requirements. So we offer full customization. We do offer explanations of legalese, but I think what's even better than explaining the legalese is to not use legalese in the first place. So yeah. although our templates are sourced from the gold standard libraries, our legal team go through the additional effort of simplifying the language. And sometimes you can't simplify and, and we only effectively explain sections when we can't simplify more than we've already simplified, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. The more you can reduce um, that risk of people just not knowing. Yeah. It's that bit where, it's, where if people just don't know what they're reading. Then that's yeah. the high, then there's less certainty and you're probably going to sign a, 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 you know, a contract that isn't the best for you. So it's kind of like an education thing for you, I guess, I guess as well, really. Absolutely. And I think we offer education both within the contracts and the platform, but where we have had a lot of success in terms of sourcing users has also been by answering typical questions because lots of people Google legal questions and we don't have all the answers yet, but, but we have quite a few and, and that helps improve people's education and understanding of contracts. Brilliant. Thank you, Jake, for being on the show. It was a pleasure. And um, yeah, thanks for having we, me. And hopefully uh, we can have you on again and best of luck with Paper Round. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much.